that was trippy. We should make sure that, uh, that cause if you adjusted the chair, we want to make sure the shots. Uh, okay. Okay, hold on. Uh, so first of all, uh, we are live on Facebook, on IMAX's uh, Facebook. Okay, so, hi guys. <laughs> hi everyone hey, not here. Exactly, uh, also we're filming and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so first of all, let me start by saying a huge thank you to IMAX for letting us do the screening series and letting us project this. You haven't seen this in a little while, have no, you? No, I mean, it's, it's the, it was kind of the, the reason I initially and immediately said yes, because it's just like, us directors, we don't get to revisit our movies on big screens. Um, five years, I mean, is it, I think it's been like five years since this movie came out, and so um, the chance to see it in this format, with this sound, with this scale, very fun, and it was kind of huddled in the back corner, kind of reliving it, um, and it was really cool. It was really fun. One of the things that, for me, is that it's been Now we look a lot better, right? Now that we're lit? <laughs> I feel like we look a lot better suddenly. One of the things about this movie, though, is uh, it's been five years, but one of the things that strikes me, and I think it'll, I think most of you will agree with me, is that the robots look so good. I, I, I can't, I, literally, I was trying to, because I remember, for the most part, which were the real robots and which were CG robots, but there were a few moments where I was like, wait, I don't think that was a real robot, but it freaking looks like one, man. Um, Eric Nash, who is our VFX suit, um, and Digital Domain, um, they did a great job on this movie. And uh, it's pretty seamless work. And normally you watch VFX work from even like 18 months ago and you're like, oh, well that was clearly a generation prior. And the evolution is so kind of accelerated in that craft within our industry. But uh, even five years down the road, those effects look really kind of sophisticated and photo real. Well, I think uh, maybe something you should mention is that you have practical robots on set and those practical robots, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you would have a practical robot, and then you would like CGI a little bit of it, so the practical looked practical. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's it's been interesting to me, just kind of as a spectator of movie culture over the last few years, because um, interest. It was interesting to me that obviously there was a lot of talk around Force Awakens, how kind of JJ wanted to do as much stuff in camera and practical as possible, and. You know, we had the same approach four years prior, and I know it's because both of us have kind of studied at the knee of Steven to some extent, and Spielberg was an exec producer on this movie and very involved in Real Steel and um, has been a big part of JJ's career. And I know, like, I think my, like, my first meeting with Spielberg on this movie, he's like, I know Jurassic Park was a long time ago, but you know what? Best decision we ever made was building some, anim you know, some actual, you know, robotic, pieces that could give a photo reality to the actors to react off of and to the VFX uh, team so that they have a basis for what you know they're aspiring to and uh, and so we decided to build we built Noisy Boy we built Adam whose head you as you've seen still resides kind of troublingly that he's decapitated and his head is in the lobby of my uh, company 21 laughs but and we built uh, Oh, and we built some parts of Zeus, and we built Ambush. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time on the genesis of the project, but uh, talk a little bit about the genesis By of the By the way, project. anything we can do to talk about Real Steel and delay and potentially avoid conversation about Stranger Things Season 2 or <laughs> Uncharted, um, just because literally I almost had to cancel, just because I was like, this whole evening feels like a spoiler risk of huge <laughs> fucking proportions. Because I like, if anyone's seen even one interview with me, I have a big mouth. I talk way too much. I'll, I'll stop you. Okay, please. I, I, I will, but I as will much you. conversation as you want to say on Unreal Steel, what was the question? I don't know. We're okay. talking about Stranger Things Season 2. <laughs> no, no, we're not talking about Stranger Things Season 2. No, no. Uh, uh, I want to talk about the genesis of the project okay. and, and how you got attached. And was this because this was unlike anything you'd done previously and you know you were known as the quote unquote night at the museum guy or yeah it's really interesting to me um because it really is on the one hand it's so different from what i'd done prior the kind of more like comedic family kind of movies like the night museum movies which i feel like i could make 30 movies 50 movies and i'll still go to my grave in, in some i'm gonna stop you yeah. you've been involved in stranger things yeah oh that's true so now i'll go to my grave as the deck producer of uh, stranger things but certainly the night at the museum movies have defined a lot of my work and the kind of perception of my work and this came to me because steven and stacy snyder who are running dreamworks called me up and they're like we got this boxing robot movie 
um, that we kind of can't crack and it's been in development for a while and it had some like estimable producers involved in Don Murphy and Robert Zemeckis and Jack Rapke and Steven exec producing and um, they sent it to me and it was just one of those things and I've had this feeling a few times I actually had it when I read the spec pilot of Stranger Things and a few other things where I just I knew the first time I read it oh I know what to do with this and and I kind of, my sense very early on was that the robots were gonna be cool, but that the robots were not gonna be the unique element in the movie, especially post, at that point, what, three to five Transformers movies we had? Um, and that the father-son movie, the redemption story of that Hugh Jackman character was gonna be the heart of the movie. And that's why literally one of the first ideas I pitched was that the last fight, we should have Adam go into shadow mode which was not in the script, and we should have Hugh find redemption in the eyes of his son, and his son should witness his dad being magnificent at something. And so that moment um, was what I pitched Stephen in our first meeting, and, and you know, watching it now with the remove of several years, like that father-son movie is at the core of the movie, and it's why when we talk about kind of how the movie was received and this and that, it's like, the fact it was marketed to any extent as like Transformers Light was such a massive error. And I kind of feel like we had a sense of that as we were marketing it, but now, you know, with retrospect, it's clear as day to me. You know what's funny though, the film did well. It did, yeah. uh, I, I, I should have researched this, I apologize. I don't know what it did worldwide, but I remember talking to Stacey Snyder at a junket. 300 million, by the way. Right, exactly, that is not jump change. No, nope. for no, nope. I'll take it, I'll take it. And, and it, um, I mean, I won't take it. It's not like I get it. So, but but I will accept that outcome. And it did well. Um, but it did it did especially well overseas, and it did well here domestically. And you know, the reason that, as I've told you, and one of, I think what gave us this idea to do this is, uh, I mean, a by the way, Frosty was like my introduction to Twitter. He visited the set of Real Steel like what is now close to six years ago, and. It's like, you know, you don't know this world. No one's like tweeting from the Saturday Night at the Museum too. Um, so you might want to kind of be accessible to the fans of this genre that you're now stepping into. So you were a bit my, my kind of spirit guide into this world. Um, you, you could step up with tweeting a little bit more. I know, I'm more of a spectator. I, anyway, but now, especially with Stranger Things, I feel like, anyway, we'll talk about that later. But, um, but we felt like the movie um, we were happy with how it did, and yet the most frequent tweet I get is about the sequel to Real Steel, um, which I wish I had a conclusive answer. The, here's the truth. We started developing a sequel like six months before the movie came out because we knew as soon as we started previewing this movie, and it was it was just getting like mid to high 90s at every test screening. We, we should explain though that mid to high 90s is a very high number for It's tests. a high number, it's like, yeah. Um, it, it just happens really rarely, but the movie had something that audiences responded to, and so we started coming up with ideas for the sequel. The simple truth, the kind of most concise truth I can express is that it, it proved, and it has proven really hard, to come up with a sequel that doesn't feel like a rehash of the first movie. Like, yeah, people want to see Adam beat Zeus. I would love to see Adam beat Zeus. But, you know, you don't want to retell the story of kind of an alienation between Charlie and Max, because that is really the plot of the first movie. Um, we did explore, there's one aspect to this movie that got cut out that was in the movie and, and Steven always loved it. And it was, you know that scene where we're in the gym or it's pre-fight with Twin Cities and Adam sees himself in the mirror? Well, there was, I mean, my God, I've never actually shared this, but when the movie first came out, people were like, I saw Adam move. Adam definitely moved, right? He has, he has consciousness. And like, I, I kind of fell back into this stock answer of, I don't know, you know, it's whatever you want to decide for yourself. But, when we shot that scene, he absolutely moved. He recognizes himself. And and there was a whole moment, I mean, I think it's okay to say all this now that, it's been five years. but there's a moment where before the third, before the fifth round of the final fight, um, they're like, we're throwing in the towel, it's over, and Max and Charlie are, uh, are arguing, and we see Adam in the background raise his finger and give like a one more time gesture. And in script, you're like, that's fucking awesome.
awesome. Like that's gonna be goosebumps, it confirms the sentient nature of Adam. But when we put the movie together, it felt like as warm hearted as the movie was, that was one one degree to fairy tale for that movie. And so we we kind of one area that, that I still would love to explore is that notion of how was Adam built? What is it about his design that might have embedded some artificial or organic intelligence and consciousness such that he is self-aware to some extent? So all I'll say is we've, we've attempted it a few times with a number of writers and no draft got me, Hugh, and Stephen all there to a yes in the same moment. It all kind of felt like it wasn't quite enough the promise of a new story and a new movie. And I have to tell you, I had a weird experience watching it tonight because on the one hand, it felt really good to like revisit an old friend, but it, it also weirdly um, kind of cemented my conviction that I, I just shouldn't make a sequel unless I'm sure it will be better. I, I don't want to do one because I really, you know, Andrew Stanton had an interesting tweet recently about just like, yeah, it's like, people put the outcome of a movie in a certain column, and yet um, that's not the full story of a movie. That movie lives on with the people who respond to it forever. Yeah. And, um, you know, like this movie, and I've experienced this anecdotally, it's like people love this movie for a lot of really authentic reasons, and I don't want to go for a land grab at a sequel just because it's available. I'd like to do it only if it feels like an escalation or an improvement or a next step. One of the things that people uh, really, uh, one of the things I really enjoy and I think people really enjoy are the boxing scenes because you use real fighters when you were crafting this in pre-production. Uh, so talk a little bit about that aspect of the film. Well, the way we did it is um, we built real robots for a lot of the scenes. So like that scene that has real, it felt magical to me like when Adam first wakes up and you see the kid kind of react. That's because that robot was operated and real, and there was there's not a visual effect in that scene. So for performance scenes, especially with a kid actor, the magic you get from real thing was indispensable. For the fights, obviously that would require robotic sophistication that no movie could afford. So we had Sugar Ray Leonard as our boxing consultant, and he worked with um, Garrett. The, you know the dude with one eye who was Midas's operator? That was our um, our fight, our, our second fight choreographer and, and stunt coordinator. And we spent like a month at Giants, which I think is where Favreau did all the motion capture sure. for. It's like near here, actually. I feel like it's down here in Playa, but um, it's a motion capture volume. And we had real fighters come in and dotted up data capturing suits and we choreographed and filmed the fights in mocap and that's how we did all those fights i'm very curious you built all these practical robots uh where the hell did they end up well as i mentioned earlier adam's head is in my office um the rest of them are in uh the warehouses of legacy um which is oh, uh, legacy effects stan yes winston. legacy effects stan winston and i only, i know this because um, you know, when we, we visited Legacy on Stranger Things to make the Demogorgon, I have, you know, a movie now getting made called Kin that also, you know, uses uh, some legacy effects. And I know that somewhere in that warehouse are my robots, because every time a director, buddy, or colleague goes there, they say, your robots are still alive and well somewhere in a warehouse at Legacy. I'm just I'm just trying to imagine that they're sitting, like, in a crate, like, from the... Movie. Like Noisy Boy, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to touch on more stuff, but I know we have limited time, so I, I want to touch real quick on, I want to switch to Arrival, okay. which for a lot of people... Uh, have any of you seen it yet? Okay, oh, well, a few. Okay, well, soon, Friday. So we're not going to do any spoilers, you don't have to worry, but like, I just want to touch on this real quick. Arrival comes out Friday, uh, it's one of the best films of the year, uh, it's top three for me, wow. it's, it is phenomenal. I can't put into like how um, like I thought about it the next day, okay. which yeah. rarely happens. Okay. So I just want to touch on real quick. You produced it with Twenty One Laps, which is your company. Yeah. Uh, so talk a little bit like, about producing this movie, and did you know it was going to be so special? When I, you got I, I had a feeling it was going to be that special, and I mean, it, it's all, you know, it's kind of conscious because what 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 happened on Real Steel is it gave me a taste of making things in a broader range of tone and a broader range of genre. 
And, you know, I'm kind of aware, like, the, the perception of me will always, to some extent, be like, oh, he does more comedies and family friendly and blah, blah, blah. But, like, my taste as an audience member is far more broad than that. And so the, the whole goal for 21 Laps was let's make shit in a variety of styles and tones. And, um, well, you've also been pushing that in the last year or two than at the beginning. Uh, yeah, well, I've been, that was my stated aim for like for the last 10 years. But for the first four years, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, you know, and people assume that it's like most director deals, which is like some kind of vanity deal where you're basically just developing stuff for you to make. But I actually wanted to develop stuff to collaborate with other filmmakers. The first one was Spectacular Now, which we found as a book, thank you. Um, and, you know, Ponsolt and Miles and Shailene, and that cost like $2 million and, you know, was very well received. And that was my first taste, like, oh, it's actually not only gratifying, but really interesting. Like, your job, right? Every day, you talk to a different kind of creative person. And that makes your work and your life interesting because every day is different and you get to see the kind of range of modalities for storytelling. So for me, when I work with Ponsold or I work with Steve Villeneuve or I work with the Duffers, it's radically different, filmmaker to filmmaker. And I find it really interesting. We found Story of Your Life as a short story that's never been optioned, um, had never been approached by the movies. And we knew as soon as we read it that it was really, really meaty and that rarest of science fiction stories in that it was as emotional as it is cerebral. Yeah, it's really smart sci-fi. And uh, I mean, it's just like, I, I wish, obviously you'll all see it this weekend and uh, we'll, we'll move on, but I'll just say that uh, it, it's an achievement and I really do believe it's gonna be up for a lot of awards at the end of the year. But you know, when you, you, I'm, I'm realizing I'm blabbing so much, I don't know that I'm always answering your questions, so my apologies on that. But you said, do we know it would become this? We knew that when we had Denis, who at that point had not done Prisoners, had not done Sicario, but we knew off of Incendie that this guy was like an emerging maestro. So we got Denis, and we got this short story, and we got this screenwriter, Eric Heiser, and we knew we didn't quite know who was gonna be in it yet, how it would be released, blah, 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 but we knew that that kind of coalescence of creative elements um, with us as producers, and it's like, there's no magic there. We just grind, we work really, really hard to get things right. And so I did have a sense it would be good, but like Stranger Things, all I knew is it would be good. I didn't know that it would be received the way it has. Uh, I want to get to Stranger Things, but first I want to touch on Uncharted. Mm -hmm. uh, how long were you circling this project or being sort of talking about this project before it got announced? I've been interested in this project for years. Like, I, I you know, I, I played and loved every iteration of the game. It is, I think, you know, I think it's largely a kind of popularly accepted notion that it's, it's as cinematic a game as we've had maybe ever, certainly of late. And it's cinematic because it's not only kind of wildly visual, but it's really rooted in character and a very specific tone and a sense of fun, right? Of like, when is the last great fun fucking action dynamic treasure hunting movie, right? It's like, it's not Indiana Jones, it's not National Treasure, it's very specific and it's all kind of anchored in Nathan's tone. Um, and, uh, and so I've been interested in it and I've just kind of been quietly letting people know I'm interested in it, but other people have been involved, I've been busy and a moment finally appeared quite recently where I was like, me, okay, me. And, uh, and Sony and, and the producer involved were like, yeah, that actually makes perfect sense. I'm like, yeah, that's what I've been saying for a little while. Um, so I am, I am unabashedly thrilled um, to be making that next year. Oh, so that's what I wanted to ask you. Is that your next? Project? Yes, that's my next project. And normally as a director, you attach to something. I think I know of at least one director in this room, but it's like the dance we always do is like, oh, I'm attached to this. And like, you look at my IMDb page and it looks like I'm making 19 movies Actually, right now. 64. 64. Um, <laughs> but no, Uncharted, like I am not messing around. I am so committed to this thing and I'm in it on a script level with Joe Carnahan. Um, who knows what he's doing, and is that's been that's been a really freaking fun collaboration. I, I got to tell you that my, the highlight of the last few days, or maybe it was a week ago, I spoke to Joe. He gave me some good quotes about Uncharted. We ran them, and then he's tweeting about football, and you got on him on Twitter, which you rarely do, and said, "Shouldn't you be writing?" Yeah, he was football? tweeting on a Sunday, and I happen to know that he literally left his house 
to go somewhere, like he's in a remote location with the sole purpose of escaping the house that has his young kids in it so that he can write this script that I need very, very soon. Um, and I'm like, yeah, go like cloister yourself in like this, you know, fortress of solitude somewhere that I won't share with the world. Um, and then I'm on an airplane and I'm reading these tweeting like about Sunday football. I'm like, what the hell, man? Get back to work. Um, so then we had like a, we had like a three tweet long Twitter war. And then we text each other like, that was fun. Yeah, let's do it. Um, but I'm like, no, seriously, get back to work. Right. Uh, he said to me, I, I forget the exact quote, but he called it like the anti-Indiana Jones. Yeah, it is. You know, I actually love like, because I always feel like I've got a big mouth. Joe has the biggest oh, mouth. He, it's he likes, awesome. He likes to talk. Like, Joe is so entertaining in real life and on social media because he's fearless, he's candid. And um, I do think that where he's telling the truth is that Indiana Jones, like people kind of, they compare Uncharted to it because I guess both are treasure hunting movies. Um, but Indy, you know, was an academic. Indy was kind of, there was nobility and a kind of well-intentioned kind of- uh, It belongs in a museum. Well, like, you know, he actually like was heroic. Whereas Drake is, he the last thing he would ever want to call himself or be called is heroic. And if he has heroic qualities within him, they're in spite of his kind of like rogue nature. And so, Certainly, the movie we're going to make is going to, um, well, I'm sure that, you know, maybe from a million miles away, it'll it'll have those indie elements. It's very much a much grittier, more naturalistic, real world, contemporary. That's the other thing. Indiana Jones is a period piece, right? We always kind of forget that, like, it's not set in this world, in this now, whereas Uncharted will be. Uh, I'm very curious, uh, my last thing on Uncharted, uh, have you thought about casting? I've definitely thought about it. Have you been meeting with people? Um, what have I said already on the internet? I don't think you've said you've been meeting no. with people, uh, there's just, but there's... this is the time to announce that to the world, that you've been meeting with actors, and you're just having that, those conversations to see who might be right. The truth is, they're, the, only, the conversations that are happening right now are with the studio and uh, the producers talking about who feels right. Um, to us and to me. I have to ask you, someone on Twitter, I was mentioning this to people earlier, someone on Twitter was saying uh, for, for casting, uh, Nicolay, what's the guy from Game of Thrones? Nick Coster, uh, yeah, that guy. With the three names. Right. Can someone pronounce it correctly for us? Nikolaj. Okay, we're not even gonna go for the second of the... I can't pronounce... I... Okay, we'll go... Okay. okay. Wow, so you're impressive there. So, um, so someone pitched him for... Man, I've been pitched everyone. Oh. Uh, honestly, God bless you, Twitter. But I made a joke on Twitter, like, you're saving me the money of hiring a casting director, Twitter, because um, from to from Nikolaj to... Bruce Campbell you know, to, and Sully? I mean, Oscar Isaac, you know, filling in. Um, everyone that you would kind of, you know, Pratt, uh, Chris Evans, Chris Pine, like, I mean, the suggestions are... So it's every actor that's out there. It's every actor who is ruggedly handsome, which is, say, every movie star, um, uh, and who looks anything like this square-jawed, you know, chiseled feature Drake. Um, I'm not actually going to base my casting on Twitter suggestions. Um, I'm sorry to admit to Twitter if you're watching. You know, someone, um, by the way, has suggested something that's going to end up being true. I know. You're like, it was me. That's actually, maybe I've even said the name in this room. Who knows? <gasps> <Exactly>. um, <laughs> eventually, if people keep suggesting ideas and actors, one of them will prove to be true. So um, I would expect, I mean, look, we're, we're very hard at work on the script right now. And yeah, I'm going to um, guess right now, you're not filming before March. I'm definitely not filming for a month. Right, exactly. So this no. is a lot of time. The goal is to film in the late spring, early summer. Let's jump into a show that a lot of people in this room have watched and loved. It's called Stranger Things. Yeah, we're there. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're not going to get into specifics. No, no, I, 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 I don't care. No, no, no. Seriously, I'd be murdered if I if I gave away spoilers. Stop it. I can't even make eye contact with you now. Uh, she asked about Barb. And I feel like even without a word, I would give something away with my gaze. <laughs> I'm not, I, I really don't want to, uh, obviously, I don't want to ruin it. Well, you it. read that announcement today, right? We finally announced those other three actors, and that's, um, yeah, that's uh, well, very exciting. Let, let's take a step back. Uh, you produced Stranger Things. You also directed episodes three and four of the series. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, like, that was also a, a change in the show in terms of you, 
what did you bring to episode three and four that the Duffers have not brought in episode one and two? Well, in terms of filming. The, well, A, you know, it started off really simply because the, the second half of the season wasn't written. And so I was like, boys, you need to get back in the writing room and just knuckle down on that. I'll take three and four. Now, selfishly, I had read three and four. So I knew it had the Christmas lights. I knew it had R-U-N run. And I knew it had the body in the quarry that Hopper at the end of four would end up cutting open. Well, well we won't get too many specifics, though, for people who well, haven't seen it. Oh, is that a spoiler? I feel like everyone's seen Stranger Things by now, right? <laughs> Guys, it's been streaming since July 15th. You should definitely check it out. Wait, wait, we can uh, talk about season one. No, I thought you meant spoilers for season two. I, is that a spoiler if I just ruined season one? Oh my God, stop it, Barb. Really, it's enough with you, okay? Um, so, but when, it, the only thing that changed is this. Um, the Duffers and I, from the first time we met, it was a really, really good, just kind of connection. Um, I, uh, their script was amazing, and I knew five minutes into our meeting, they were ready for this, but that they needed a kind of big brother to, you know, kind of, walk that road with them and so from that day on there's a lot of mutual trust and it's a very small circle of people on our show it's like me and dan cohen who works at 21 laps with me and it's the duffers um and then there's like three execs at netflix that we deal with so it's it's an aberrant television show in that there's no studio there's no television production company there's like a couple of movie guys and these twin 32 year olds who are kind of like, yeah, we just have it all in our head and can we do it that way? And the whole idea was we're gonna do it exactly that way. So the only thing that I would say I brought to it is they, going in, the feeling was to have minimal, minimal camera movement because a lot of the movies of the era that we are invoking in Stranger Things were more kind of reliant on composition and blocking than on the kind of more dynamic camera movement that we've grown accustomed to in the last like 15 to 20 years of directorial styles. And when I started directing episodes three and four, I just, it was irresistible. It wasn't like Scorsese, Cape Fear, kind of like swoopy aggressive moves, um, but those kind of languid drifts and those Spielbergian push-ins, just kind of movement as a way of increasing atmosphere and of punctuating emotion. I did a lot of that. And while I was shooting the brothers, you know, we were having dinner, like we're watching your daily. So every time you move the camera, we're like, oh, it's so juicy. So we're just gonna start doing that. The other influence I know I had is I got Technocrane on a lot of days, which is not really affordable on a TV series, but I did it because that's what I would do on one of my movies. And I, the, the Duffers and our line producer blamed me for getting them slightly Technocrane addicted. Um, because they ended up using a lot of techno in, in the back half. One of the things we talked, we, we did an interview before the show came out and before I'd seen episode eight, and uh, but you told a great story about Netflix, which I, I want to uh, sort of talk about again, which is that you went sort of, the, the episode got big, and you needed maybe more money, or you needed to cut back, and you weren't sure what to do, and you basically went to Netflix, and you know, and with a network, maybe that would be an issue, but. Well, like, on a movie or on a studio show, if you have a script that is beyond the box of what they want to spend, th this is just how it goes. They go, well, you got a budget problem. Sean, you have a budget problem. And then it's like, okay, we have to figure out how we're gonna like shave and grind and squeeze to fit into the budget that yes, we all agreed to. But I got the script to eight. Have we all seen eight? Am I gonna spoil something there? So the scale of it is big. I'll just be, I'll kind of speak vaguely. Scale was big, I read it. And I called up Netflix and I said, look, you're gonna read it, it's fucking awesome, but it is, know that it's unaffordable. So either don't fall in love with the awesomeness you're gonna read because we can't afford it and we're gonna have to start plucking elements out to get it into budget, or let me say to you right now, for X more dollars, we'll give you that. We'll give you everything you're about to read. And they read it and you know, it's a rare thing that I would even feel comfortable asking for more money. Because it's just like, it's a hard conversation, but I, I just kind of felt like, you know what? We're, it's a very kind of honest collaboration. It's a small group, as I said, and they can say no. And if they say no, we'll figure something out. But they read the script and they said, okay, you got the money, go to work. Yeah, that's not the norm with the networks. Not at all, not at all. The norm with networks is A, that you would be told no, but B, you would never ask because you would know the answer in advance. So you just wouldn't, 
You wouldn't invite a battle that you know there's no chance of winning. But this, there was never that kind of battle mentality on Stranger Things. It felt like actual partnership. You, look, Netflix is known for not sharing numbers. Have they actually shared you any numbers? They really don't. <laughs> I did. I, I did hear rumbling, but again, it's like I'm reading the same sites that we all are that are trying to glean numbers so in like, the absence of numbers. No, I have no inside scoop. It's crazy. Um, I have no inside scoop. I do know. No, I really don't know anything. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, no, it is crazy. I, I mean, our real the the kind of the height of our like what is happening was um, we had heard that Obama asked for the series on DVD, which Netflix doesn't do DVDs because that would be counter to their existence. Um, and the rumor has it, and I believe it's pretty confirmed, that he then binged all eight on Air Force One to China. And when he came back, he invited me and the Duffers and our kids to the White House. Um, and that was, that was definitely the kind of height of the surreality that the last few months on Stranger Things has been. Yeah, I mean, there's no way when you make a show like that that you think, obviously, it might be like a little bit like a, you hope to be a hit, but it became part of the zeitgeist. No, you never, it's so beyond anything. You, we, we knew it was good, we thought it was unique, and we, we hoped that it would be popular, but never ever did we even imagine or even hope that it would be popular on this scale, and certainly not like a phenom, zeitgeisty kind of thing. So, I have to ask, you guys obviously knew you were going to start making season two. Uh, were you writing? Were the Duffers writing? Were you guys thinking about season two uh, before it premiered? I feel like I feel like I've read something about that. I never I never want to say something that that either me or the Duffers haven't already said. But I mean, I I feel like maybe they've alluded well, I, to I, this. But before the, the thing aired, we talked about like because uh, you said. Like, see, it's me with my big mouth. I don't even remember it after I say it. What did I? What did I admit well, you previously? Basically said, like, you had ideas for season two. If we're lucky enough to go do it. Okay. And so the actual truth is, we did have ideas for season two. We were actually talking and figuring stuff out. Yeah. Um, and it is true that we didn't get the official pickup for like a while, um, which was confusing to us because I felt like we were popular by the day after yes, we launched that weekend. Um, and then like we and the world had to wait like maybe even a month or something for the official pickup. But no, we were kind of, we are given the wink, wink, you guys should seriously start thinking about what you want to have happen in season two um, before it was announced. Uh, this is a question I don't think you've answered yet. Uh, have you started filming season two yet? Today. Oh, so it started today? Today. Uh, what's today, Monday? Today is Monday. We, um, and literally it's funny because the, the Duffers just texted me while I was in here saying like, the stamina goes. like. It's day one and we're exhausted. And it is true, like, that is the thing about directing, is it, it is a grind, but you, you build up like a muscle or an immunity to it. And uh, when you've had, they've been in writing mode for the last several months. And, um, and, and so, you know, I was amused to hear that like that muscle memory needed to be rebuilt. I'm gonna ask you some questions that hopefully you can answer. These are not spoilers. Is it another eight episodes? No, it's nine. Okay, That's, I'm sure people will be happy to hear that. Uh, talk a little bit about, are you gonna direct any? Yes, I am, we are a little superstitious, and uh, we meaning the Duffers and I, so just like last year, they're doing one and two, I'm going in and doing three and four. So the first four are gonna kick off exactly the same as last time. So you are obviously going to set really soon. I am going to start prepping right around Thanksgiving and I'll be filming my episodes through December and January. Are you guys filming in the same locations? We are filming in Atlanta, again. I feel like that's how the Millie Brown thing leaked, because like someone saw her trick-or-treating in Atlanta. Um, and I was so bummed about that, because Netflix had this really clever idea of taking a picture at our table read last week and posting it upside down, which is what we did. Yeah. Um, but then like two days before our clever idea got to uh, debut, a bunch of places were reporting that Millie was gonna be a part of season two. It's so funny because uh, uh, people uh, have spoiled a lot of things by just uh, catching people at airports. I know. Airports are, I mean, th this is the tr airports are major, um, although somehow, like, how does Game of Thrones do it? That's like, no, well, I, I, everyone knew. Did, yeah, well, everyone okay, knew. I didn't, so I'm glad I was in, the, did everyone knew about Jon Snow, really? A lot of people knew. Okay. It's because they, they were, he was spotted at airports. Like, okay, well, so right. yes, I now, I will live in fear of airports, but, um, <laughs> 
Yeah, it's uh, as soon as, because people know where that show films. Everyone now knows we film in Atlanta, and I guess Millie was spotted in Atlanta, and it's too big a coincidence. Um, but thrilled to confirm that she is back in some fashion in season two. Uh, when are you guys aiming to have it premiere? That I can't say. I do have a sense of it. Um, it was promised when we announced that we were picked up for season two and we gave those chapter headings. I believe it ended with coming in 2017, and that much is true. Um, you can do a little bit of math. We're not sure, magicians, yeah. so there's no way that it launches in spring. Um, since I just admitted we started filming today, and we're doing nine. Uh, what can you tease people? Originally, you said it was going to start, I believe, shortly after season one ended. Is that, I don't want to obviously put you on the spot, but is that still the plan? Um, it is, I'm not going to say how much time has gone by. It is not like the next day, I'll say that. And it is, as I've said before, there are, as you can now see, several new characters who I think several of them are going to be new fan favorites because they're great, great new characters. Um, but we are definitely, we're sticking primarily with our core group and what is different how are they changed from the experience of last season? And um, as we saw in the finale, I feel like I don't want to say anything about the finale of season one, for those of you who haven't seen it, but- It ended a little bit on a cliffhanger. Yeah, little... like maybe everything, maybe normal is never possible again. Yeah, I believe that uh, there's a quote that once you've gone to war, it, that's it. Like you, you permanently change it. I mean, Will Byers was in that upside down for a while. He was. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it, but, but, Season two is about this determined desire to return to normalcy in Hawkins, in the Byers family, in that group of friends. And it, it's the struggle to reclaim normalcy and maybe the impossibility of it. Uh, my last thing before I open it up to the audience for questions, the show is a huge hit, like just a massive hit. When you're doing season two, do you already right now start thinking, shit, they might want a season three? Um, we are not gonna be caught off guard and we don't want to be making stuff up like the day before we have to write it and make it so um we we are definitely optimistic and and we have we have started thinking ahead thinking ahead how far down the line have you thought that i definitely can't say <laughs> that i definitely can't try say. yeah i mean part of the reason i'm i'm wary of answering too many questions i know i hate it as a fan and I won't name movies and shows have done this, where if you ask enough questions, eventually the actor or the director or the producer is going to be forced to lie. And I always hate it when someone has said, no, it's not that. And then you see the movie or the show, and you're like, no, it was that. Why You you lied to us for a year. I mean, it's, it, it's not con. Well, that, <laughs> that, I got to tell you, in, in all seriousness, I think that Into Darkness is not a bad movie. Some people come at it. I think the real issue with that is that they lied for so long. No, it's really, I mean, it's interesting because JJ was at the premiere of Arrival. I was there with him was like yesterday. And we, you know, we talked about just this culture of, I mean, in a culture of ubiquitous knowledge, the challenge of keeping secrets, of preserving the unknown, which, you know, JJ more than anyone has kind of expounded on the value of that. Um, it's, it's a tough push-pull in our culture, right? Because everyone wants answers, everyone wants information, but you don't really. We actually, as an audience, want the unexpected. And um, it's why, you know, when we did our table read to Stranger Things last week, kind of the speech I gave to our now very big cast is, let's keep our mouths shut, because let's try and give people a discovery the way they got in season one. Yeah, listen, I think that's great. I, I think hopefully the questions I've been asking are like the, you know, it's on the, on the cusp of- No, no, you're right you know on the edge, mean? but you're super classy. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, just, classy just, might be the wrong word. Right, exactly. Uh, so I want to open it up to questions. Uh, and uh, so I was going to break it up into, into parts, but F it. Let, does anyone? Uh, yeah, so just a couple, but you sort of answered them previously when you were talking about Um, we, should, we should repeat the question. You yeah, yeah. It? So I, I'm, the, the question is, did we actually shoot the scenes in Real Steel that are no longer in Real Steel where Adam, where we prove his sentient kind of awareness? Um, we did. And 
in some cases I knew on the day like that one more time, I knew when I shot it, that's probably not going in. It's just, it's a bridge too far. But that mirror scene, I mean, I literally was, I mean, it, one of the amazing things, this is a small digression, is I played a lot of music on set while filming. And what was interesting is when we shot that scene, it was just me and the remote control robotic puppeteer. And I played this piece of music and the puppeteer moved Adam to the feeling of the music. And after that scene, he said, can you always do that? Because it's really, you know, as a puppeteer, you don't have words. You just have the feeling conveyed by movement. And so that became a big thing we did a lot of on this movie is in scenes without dialogue, I always played music on set to kind of communicate the feeling that I wanted from the robotic puppeteering. But yes, we did film some scenes where Adam was sentient and then we very willfully decided not to put it on a Blu-ray or anything like that because that's not the version of this story that I wanted to tell ultimately. What was, do you remember what the piece of music was? Um, on that day, it might have been a piece by Brian Eno called Discreet Music um, that I've loved for many, many, many years. Um, but I mean, you know, this is, I'll just share this anecdote if there's any, I mean, you're all here because you love movies. And this is, you know, I told this anecdote to the Duffers because a big part of how I try and be a producer is how Steven was a producer to me. And when we filmed the opening of Real Steel, you know that Alexi Murdoch song that's playing as he's driving? So I played that music in the cab of that truck for Hugh while we were filming it. And we did, we did it, right? And we were doing that shot where the reflections are going by, that's all practical. That was just a, 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 a stroke of good fortune. The angle of the truck and the camera reflected the Ferris wheel the way it did. Um, Steven Spielberg was in London making War Horse when I was doing Real Steel. And he calls me up on a weekend. He's like, so I was watching dailies. And already you're like, well, how are you even watching dailies while you're directing <laughs> your own movie? And he goes, I, I noticed that you played that music for Hugh um, in that truck scene. I'm like, yeah. He goes, take a look at take three before you say action. Hugh is sitting there and that music was hitting him somewhere really lonely. And it's before the take. It's before you said action, but I saw it in the dailies. And maybe you can find a way to put it in the movie after he parks the truck, because you got something really honest out of his face in that moment. And it's in the movie. He parks the truck and he sits there and you just, you see that that guy is the loneliest man in the world. And that's freaking Spielberg in London directing his own much bigger movie, watching dailies with that level of sensitivity and attentiveness and sharing that with me as his director. And it was like the greatest act and example of additive producing input. Um, and so I just, I've always been really inspired by that. You did say you had several. Okay, yeah. Um, was there ever a, at any point in the development of the movie or uh, maybe even the shot, uh, was there a connection to uh, Machido in any way between like, uh, like Adam's programming or about like his genesis or anything? I mean, no, I mean, it's interesting because I, I, I repeat it for people. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Was there ever a connection in our minds between Talk Machido and Adam? Um, the reason I paused before I answered is we do have sequel scripts that heavily explore the origin story of Adam. And in the moments where I'm determined to not give up, that remains, like that's something I know I wanna see. I wanna see who created Adam and what was the accident of his creation or the intentionality of his creation. How, the, did, he how did he wind up in that metal valley? Well, I gotta tell you, you're further along in developing sequels than I ever thought you were. Oh no, we're, it's not like I've been dicking around for five no, years. No, because, you know, like, I'll tell you because, Earlier in the conversation, earlier tonight, I said, I spoke to Stacey Snyder a while back, yeah. and she said the film did just enough that we should think about a sequel, but it didn't do so well yeah. that a sequel is like something that's viable that we need to go do it. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. right well, on... some are like undeniable. If you make so much money, studios can't resist a sequel. But my God, especially now in 2016, I think we've seen, and look, I've made, you know, I've made sequels. I've made, multiple sequels to several of my movies, some that I've directed sequels, some that I've produced. Like, it's really, really, really hard. And now more than ever, our culture, 
our movie going rejects derivation of the first movie that feels hackneyed or same or lazy. And so, again, like I'm really grateful for seeing this movie tonight because on the one hand, it revived my inspiration, but it also raised the bar even higher. Like, I just don't want to do it if I'm not sure I'm getting it right. Let's move on uh, right there. I had a question. Um, in terms of when you were growing up, uh, animation or anime, was that an influence? Because I know the Duffer Brothers liked Elf and Life, and uh, I really thought, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a thing called Robot Dreams. Mm -hmm. And the last story in that, in that, the third vignette had a lot to do with Adam. Well, it's interesting because the, the, that was not kind of a conscious touch point for me. And it's interesting because the Duffers and I, we spent a lot of time talking about movies and taste. And, um, you know, for me, when I watch Real Steel, like certainly animation has always been very front and center for me and just my own movie going taste since I was young. But like to me, Adam is E.T. You know, like, and especially watching it, like, Adam is the other that saves this boy, just like E.T. is the other that saves the boy. And so my, my kind of inspirational touchstones um, for Real Steel tend to be more actual live action Spielbergian um, works. And it is interesting, that's a, another weird experience is seeing how there is a very connected line between Stranger Things, which is so rooted in those 12 year old boys and 11, and this movie, which is so rooted in it, what is he, 11? He says it many times. Um, and there is something about that moment of childhood that I've always loved as an audience, and I seem to revisit it a lot in my work. Um, so not the end, not, not, not that piece per se, but um, you know, kind of now I'm old enough and I've made enough movies to know like, you can never quite trace the inspirational antecedents, so I, don't, I can't be sure. Uh, right there. First of all, I want to say thanks for being here. I've been oh. a fan of yours for a long time. Thanks, man. Your work has inspired my career in film. Uh, and I love the Night at the Museum movies. Thank you. I'm just going to say it right there. Thank you. So it's a two-part question. First, what was it like getting Alan Silvestri, one of the best composed, film composers of all time, to work on all three movies? Whose idea was to get him? And also, can you share any cool uh, stories of Robin Williams on set? Alan Silvestri? Alan Silvestri, Night at the Museum. Um, I have always loved the score of Castaway, um, because it will kill your heart with that spare piano, and then it will take you to like transcendent places with those beefy strings. I knew I wanted Night at the Museum to have wonder. That was kind of the dominant kind of feeling that I wanted out of it. Obviously, it was a comedy. Obviously, there were hijinks, but it's also kind of a wondrous that premise. Sequence yeah, well. The score. And, and that was literally me listening to the score and I came up with that title sequence in the first one at like 5 a.m. I was like, we should meet all these characters before they have life in them. And that was inspired by the sketches that Alan did for me. I'll share, I'll get to the Robin Williams question, but what I will say about Alan and Danny Elfman, who did this movie, Real Steel, these are like the legendary titans, right? Let me tell you something. If they would play me a piece for a scene, and if it wasn't hitting me the way I'd want, I would go, you know what, it's not quite it. And you know what they do? They'd go write another one and they'd bring it back. And if I went, ah, it's not quite, they'd write another one. It like, that's the thing. So, and yet I'll work with some like 35 year old new composer and they're like, here's the score, like it or suck it. <laughs> you know? And it's like, but that is why a Silvestri or a, a, a Danny are legendary but it's, you see the same thing with actors, like Mickey Rooney auditioned with Dick Van Dyke for Night at the Museum, and now I've got 28-year-olds who are like, coming off a fucking Netflix show and telling me they're offer only, because they don't want to read. Like, this presumptuousness. That's what I have to ask. How much work are they booking? Or are they, are they actually? You know what? Sadly, the system doesn't exactly punish that sometimes. They get work, right? But in my experience, the people who have the goods, who have the talent, they're willing to do the work. So. Um, Alan really responded. I showed him the movie. He said yes. Um, and Danny, I mean, that this, the piece of music where Max sees Hugh boxing in That's slow motion, yeah. wow. Danny probably wrote that cue for me eight times yeah. until it literally moved me to tears. I would just be like, buddy, can we just, he's like, okay. Yeah. 
and it's so subjective, but he's willing to do the work. Robin Williams, um, you know, I always knew that that third movie would be the last museum movie that Ben and I made, but when Robin died, that definitely kind of cemented that. Um, that was the worst. Um, but, you know, literally, he was what you would imagine. When you're in a lighting setup, he's doing a 20-minute free stand-up set <laughs> on yeah. your set. I mean, I think some of it's in there, right? Um, for, like, the grips and electric. Like, you're seeing the kind of comedy set that you'll remember in 50 years. And he's doing it for free in the downtime right. on set. So it was, um, it was amazing. It was really, um, I mean, I hate that it's ended the way it has, but, um, but grateful forever. Right. Yeah. Uh, right there. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I actually, well, there's one thing, um, one thing I wanted to say. I think it's interesting and kind of ironic that uh, Spielberg and Abrams do Super 8 uh, which Spielberg produces, and then you produce Stranger Things, and in a way, you sort of out Spielberg Spielberg. Not to take anything away from Super 8, but I think you made a better Super 8 than their Super 8. Well, the, the, we, you know, the thing, I, I love Super 8, mm -hmm. um, but Steven, like, he, that shit, it's like, it is in our bloodstream as filmmakers, and I thought it was filmmakers of a certain generation, like, I get it for me and JJ, right? But the Duffers, who are like 32, who weren't alive in the year that Stranger Things is set, I remember saying to them when we were shooting, I'm like, so this isn't even like a nostalgia piece for you. It's nostalgia for me. What is it for you? And they're like, it's movie nostalgia. Mm -hmm. it's the, it is a love letter to the movies of the 80s that we grew up on later. Um, so it's just really interesting, and I do think that the key for us, but I thought this was true of Super 8 as well, is so many period pieces are using period as irony or period as clever wink wink. Remember that? Those pants were classic, right? Or <laughs> whatever it is. But um, we don't use the 80s on Stranger Things for ironic purposes. We actually mean it. We use it as setting and we use it as tone. And there is an innocence and a sincerity to that time that matches the sincerity of the storytelling of Stranger Things. And what I love about the Duffers is they're of the kind of generation that's supposedly known for like cynical, too cool for schoolness, but there's none of that to them. They are cool young guys, but like they love these characters and they love these kid characters. When everyone's like, wait, there's kids at the center of it? How are you ever gonna get people in their 20s to watch this show? I mean, that was something we heard a lot. Like, what do you do? Like, how are you gonna have teenagers or 20-somethings watch Stranger Things if it's about 12-year-olds? But it's like, we all have that 12-year-old in us, still there, still in this room, and the Duffers kind of bet on that, and I think it's been proven true. I, I just keep on thinking about South Park right now and member berries. I don't know if you guys, is anyone, is anyone watching? If you're not watching South Park, I strongly recommend, and you'll get a kick out of it if you actually watch uh, this season. But let's move on to the next question. Wait, I'll link it to someone who hasn't asked yet, and we'll be like, right there. So, clearly quite masterful at creating immersive, you and your team's immersive, encompassing worlds, and then locking the emotions in on that. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on next generation mediums like virtual reality, augmented reality, immersive cinema, and where you think your opinions are on where that's going. Uh, asking about virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and the future. Yes, your, your love for Uncharted and your desire to build well, maybe storytelling from the Uncharted world and bringing it into Well, the because, future. yeah, and it's interesting the way you connect it to Uncharted, because certainly, like, I think what we all feel when we play Uncharted is that approach, that action experience is so, so immersive, to use your words. And, you know, I've, I've already started thinking about kind of how do we approach these action sequences in a way that may or may not be the same set pieces from the game, because I think people would be disappointed if all I did was put those in live action, but that, but that, uh, that feel continuous with that immersive, you are there with Drake doing that stuff from building to building to vehicle to water to air, like that it feels kind of continuous and, and engaging. I have, you know, like many of us kind of, I've only, dabbled in samplings of virtual reality and more literal immersive technologies. There, I, I, think it is, I think it is staggeringly impressive and probably, probably a future we can't fight. Um, but 
I do think that um, I'm, I'm hoping for many, many years first of making movies in this dimension and in this format. Um, and in the challenge of making this flat screen immersive, even without us being localized in it, the way I suspect we will be, we're all, you know, we're all living our lives watching movies. I think we'll watch a change, but, um, but I think there's a certain challenge to creating a world that you are in, even if you know you're watching a two-dimensional screen. Yeah, we're, we're very early in the curve. We did with JJ and Justin on Star Trek, as you mentioned, this yep. immersive version, and uh, My World at Fox, which we can talk about. We're doing a lot of stuff in virtual reality, so it's it's an eventuality that may I know. be coming very quickly. Yep, so understood. I know it. Well, let's do just a, because uh, it's getting late, let's do just a few more questions. I don't know what time it is. Yeah, it's like a little after 10. Let's yeah. do a couple more. A couple, uh, in the very back. Um, I actually got to be there for some of the shooting, and you guys did something that was so cool. You created the fight, and then your cameras could actually go and watch it, and you could shoot any angle or do anything. Were you in Michigan, or were you here in LA? No, I was in Michigan. Yeah, no, there's this thing called the virtual camera, which I, it's interesting because I was... I was speaking to, I don't really want to speak out of school, but I was at um, Naughty Dog and we were talking about the making of, the, of Uncharted and the process. And it's very, very similar to the way we did Real Steel, which is to say, we captured the fights, but then we had a virtual camera, VC as we called it. And this was technology that was largely designed kind of out of necessity on Avatar, where you would, you can photograph this captured data from an infinite number of angles. You can literally try a shot, watch it, try another shot, edit them together, watch it go, no, you know what, I need to be tighter there. Scrub one, reshoot it tighter, but it's right there on your monitor. But where this movie got even crazier and was a technology that was only partially used on, on Avatar and will be heftily used on the sequels, I suspect, is what's called Simulcam, which is we then went to Michigan, went to that old Ford Model T factory that we used for Crash Palace, and we had the technology that when we put the camera on our shoulder, we saw our robots in that real ring. And I was able, all those shots in all those fights, we did those shots in a real stadium or arena in Michigan, but I had real-time playback of the fight converted to the robot avatars in real time while I was shooting with thousands of extras. So that was, I mean, that remains one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. And this is also 2011 or 2010. We shot in 2010, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, this guy really wants more questions. I, I, okay, so one is a comment and one is an R question. Back row's thinking this guy's repeat business, so he knows he's gonna get a, he's gonna get a follow up. Uh, we're, we're coming to you next. Yes, brother. The first comment is, is I noticed while we were watching tonight, you were sitting back there and you were just having reactions to watching your movie. And I, you know, I haven't made movies on this scale. I hope to, but in film school, you, you know, you make you make movies over and over again. You know how it's made. But I feel the same thing. Where if there's a shot that works or if something that hits me, and because I heard you laugh and react to some of the stuff which I do when I watch my stuff, it's kind of like. It reminds you why you want to do it. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I, you know what I mean? Cause oh, yeah, no. If yeah. you stop, if you lose the audience member in you, yeah. I don't think you should be making things anymore. And and I don't know how soon. I also had the benefit of this dude and this woman over there. I'm like, I want to take you to every screening I ever do. You were so into it. I was loving you. <laughs> I felt like she was leaning forward as we went into round five. Anyway, thank you. You so made my experience extra great. Um, but yeah, I do feel like, um, you know, I'm an audience member first. And the uh, second, the, the final question was, the, the Night at the Museum movies got an IMAX release, A Real Steel got an IMAX release, my favorite format. Is Uncharted going to be filmed with IMAX cameras? Um, I literally... That's a good question. Yeah, no, is, it's a really is, good question. Is Uncharted going to be filmed with <laughs> IMAX cameras? <laughs> um, as, I look, as I look at people from IMAX. Yeah. Um, we are literally only, we have not even had our first pre-production meeting. It's happening imminently in the next week. Yeah. And I mean, I, look, I have never filmed with those cameras. I have friends and colleagues who have. I think that as we talk about honoring the immersive nature of Uncharted, it's a really, really compelling idea. 
and I, I would absolutely not dismiss it. I would love to explore the viability of it. Because I remember, like, I literally remember fifth grade graduation, I went to my MX theater and saw Battle of the Smith Mm-hmm. And though it wasn't filmed in that format, it's still, it's still immersive. Yeah. Like the no, no, I love IMAX, and, and it's been a few movies um, since I made one in this format, whether, and I've never filmed in this format, so it's something I would love to explore. Also, just keep in mind that next year, uh, the Russos are making the next two Avengers movies with uh, just IMAX cameras. Only, exclusively? Yeah, the, the, wow. whole, the whole thing is, uh, I forget, what, I don't remember the name of the camera. Well, they can do that, but I'm sure I can figure it out in I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> but it's, no, I mean, but they are. They, there's it's a new, smaller camera. Uh, the Alexa. It, I don't think that's the IMAX camera, is it? I think there's a... No, it's a specific IMAX camera. Yeah, it's like a 4K IMAX digital small right. camera. Anyway, they're Good using tip. it for the Good post tip. Avengers. Thank you. Uh, we were going back. It was you, yeah? No, no, that was all uh, Tom Meyer and me. I was going to say, asking about how much of the... Of the... It, it, just the world, the approach to the world. We always wanted... I mean, it's so funny hearing that, like, the future of that movie was, like, 20, it was 2014, right? Um, it's, we had this idea from our first meeting that the movie would have future technology, but almost kind of a timeless Americana to it. And we liked, like, I remember Tom Meyer making the point, like, a diner still looks like a diner. Um, a cornfield, a county fair, looks the same as it did 50 years ago. Your phone doesn't look the same, and it won't look the same in 20 more years. But there are certain places and aspects of the American landscape that do have a timelessness. And that I wanted to kind of juxtapose that with this future, this what if of a future sport. So that was not in the script, that was by design. Yeah. And I, just, I appreciate the fact that you took the time for moments like, like that Ferris wheel shot and like all those scenes, like the cross country driving and all that. Stuff. You know why it was? Yeah. I had done so many comedies before Real Steel. In fact, I don't think I'd done a non comedy before Real Steel. But like when I was in film school, like I wasn't even interested in making comedies. It just kind of like I got successful at it and then I did a bunch more and they worked. And so it's like, none of us are probably walking the exact path we grew up when we were 23, you know? Um, it's like every job. Um, but this was my first non-comedy, and it was bliss to be able to craft aesthetics that didn't need to service the laugh first. Because if you're doing night museum, if you're doing date night, like your job is figure out how to make Steve Carell and Tina Fey funny, shoot it in a way that puts that in the foreground and don't distract from it. It's why like Paul Feig, Judd Apatow, like comedies look a certain kind of way and you're not getting too fancy because you don't want to dilute the funny. But to do Real Steel where it was my first movie and hopefully the first of many more that I am now hungrier than ever after tonight to make, <laughs> where, where you can lean into style, where you can lean into the aesthetics and they aren't first and foremost in the service of funny, um, that was, joyous for me and something I very much want to do more of. And quick question though on, about Real Steel. Uh, you obviously created this world. You have all these cool robots. Did you guys ever have conversations about doing video games? Yeah, and we have, a, weirdly, part of the viability of the sequel was based on the fact that like, I feel like our mobile app is still somehow selling. Like, that we did, we did a mobile game. We've done these collectibles. <laughs> Um, that sold like way better than you would have thought for a movie that did. Robots. Well, not, yeah, it's robots, right? It's People robots. love robots, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we, so we did some of it and maybe, you know, we could have done more, um, but there's that feeling and it's part of what keeps fueling us that like, ah, oh, there's more to do. Maybe there's, a, there's more to extend the life of this, this world. Um, and it is to this day, like Evangeline texted me a couple days ago and it was like, if I'm in town, I want to come. Like, you really don't need to come. She's like, no, no, I, I love this movie. Like, like, it's so unique for her, for Dakota, for Hugh, for me. Like, this, the making of it. It's so was, funny you say this, because Hugh told me, I will never work with Sean again. I know, that's like, like, I know. Like, we had a guy. horrible falling out. Everyone says Hugh Jackman's so nice. Yeah, no, no. he's, he's <laughs> um, real a-hole. No, it, it, uh, amazingly and annoyingly, he is as godlike, nice and warm as everyone says. 
He is the best. I, I'll actually uh, testify that him, sure him and Dwayne Johnson are both really effing nice. Yep. They just yep. are. Yep. You know? sure. Uh, for sure. Uh, okay, so and one or two more questions and we're done. Oh, I would never let someone else direct real estate. Woo! No, no, I would never, ever. No, no, to be like, I would only do it. I don't want to do it as a business thing. I would only do it as a personal thing because I love it. I, I get it, but it's like, look, say with the Night Museum movie, same thing. Like, they were, there were never going to be sequels unless I directed them. And I don't, it's subjective, right? Like, I didn't need to direct that she provided a dozen sequel. I didn't need to, like, but Real Steel, like, this movie is so so close to my heart. If we're doing a sequel, it's because I'm directing it. Perfect. Yeah. Take your time, Sean. Thank you. Right. Actually, why don't we end it there? Which Thank is you. Nice Guys, this was really enjoyable. But Thank you very much. Real, real quick, I, I want to say one more time, a huge thank you to IMAX. Yeah. Being such this a was awesome. great. I feel like you're somewhere over here. So right. Thank you. No, that was, I mean, thanks for doing the movie and several of my movies, but thanks for hosting us tonight. That was really yeah. fun. They're such awesome partners. I love the format. I'm not just saying that. Uh, Doctor Strange is out right now in theaters. Woo! The only way to see it is in IMAX 3D. Uh, but really, uh, thank you so much to IMAX. Sean, thank you so much thank for giving you us your time. My pleasure. And also, I think we have, do, do, do I have the tickets? Oh yeah, so we have some of these limited real steel. Oh yeah, I have one of these in my office. You so, guys gave me one when the movie came out. It's like, so, uh, hold on a second. Um, Sean, yeah. make the trade. How many of these posters do we have? We have 13. We have 13, 13. posters. So, do I have 13 tickets in here? Or there's more. Or I guess we pick, pick some. Not everyone. Yeah, so we're just going to pick the some. The last two numbers. The last two numbers. So, by the way, this is for people who actually.